Hello, you amazing friends. Welcome to our Boss Lady Summit for March 2022. Can you give the amazing person next to you a round of applause? Now, it's International Women's Day, hashtag break the bias. So, of course, we're going to be focusing on that. And my name's Edward. I'm very lucky to be, obviously, a man who supports women's empowerment. I completely love it. And a quick wave to Michael DeHart, too. He's another fellow dude who loves women empowerment. So I just want to say a big welcome. Now, what I want to talk to you about today is... I want to talk to you about these amazing boss ladies that we have with us. And we have a mirror early. Can we all wave to Marianne Dehan? That's Quantum Leap Global. That is Marianne Dehan. We love you. We've got Eileen Avard. Eileen Avard is going to be spectating this time. Eileen said, ooh, I want to listen in on this topic, Ed. So Eileen's going to be spectating. We'll, have, so we'll say a quick hello to Eileen. We've got Dr. Liz. Oh, my God, Dr. Liz is ring. I was in Brisbane on Friday. And I'll tell you what. If you want women's empowerment, Dr. Liz is literally the embodiment of that. We love you. And we've got Sarah Polikov. Oh, my God, Sarah, we love you, Sarah. Sarah hasn't been with us for a while, and it's so pumped to have you with us. And uh, Sarah, we just want to say a big thank you. And, of course, we've got the amazing Karen Clark. Karen, we love you. You're amazing. I saw Karen on Friday too. So without further ado, I just want to break straight into it. And because Sarah hasn't been with us for a while, we're, going to, of course, going to open with Sarah. And I'm going to hit Sarah with the first question. But before I do that, I just want to talk to you about how the flow of the event works. Firstly, um, if, if please keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the event. But if you want to network or say anything, just put it in the comments. So that'll be the best way to do it. And um, we're going to be focusing on our wonderful panellists as well. The other thing to mention as well, my legendary friends, is also please network too. Feel free to, you know, share your LinkedIn links in the group chat and network. And also too, if you are listening to the recording, which you probably are, uh, please connect with any of us and um, please uh, feel free to smash that like, share and comment. So without further ado, let's open up with amazing Sarah. And Sarah, I've got to say, um, it's looking cold where you are. How are you doing, Sarah? And what's happening, my friend? Hit that unmute and... Uh, Tell us uh, all the good stuff. Hi. Yes, we're still technically in our winter here. So I've got my beret going on. The warm weather has not hit yet. Wow. Well, how are you? Wow. Well, it's been <laughs> raining and flooding here. And um, so oh, good to have you with us. So, Sarah, I want to hit you with the first question, my friend. Sure. How do women get treated differently to men? Well, uh, the first example that comes to mind is um, men sometimes have harder career comebacks than women. And I will give you an example of this. See if you guys can, can you hear it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Getting parts of it. When I was trying to still love. <laughs> so that's one of the things is um, he had his one hit wonder, never going to give you up. We have never heard from this guy again. I mean, how many times has Madonna reinvented herself? Mm. That's, that's one point. So, um, but to a serious nature, um, how are women treated differently than men. Um, that is something I can only speak to culturally. In terms please, of please, let us know what you think, Sarah. Oh, sure, sure. So to be totally serious, um, Absolutely. in America, our bodies are legislated. That I can say is a fact for every woman in America. Now, I'm not saying it's a uh, good or bad, that is up to each person to decide. However, it is a fact that our own bodies are legislated by the government. For example, um, if we want our health insurance to cover family, sorry, family planning services, they may not cover it for women. So that turns into legislation. That happens to a lot of women. So they don't have access to family planning services. Uh, men generally don't have to think about that in America since the burden in this culture, culture sorry, is on us. And so that is uh, the thing that I can focus on the most is that our bodies here in America can be legislated. Wow, wow, that's a, that's a big serious point. Amazing, Sarah. Give a round of applause to Sarah. That was a great point to open things up and absolutely appreciate it. 
And um, I actually want to bounce over to amazing Marianne Dehan. Marianne, so good having you with us. How are you today and what's happening? I'm fabulous and we're soaking wet down here. It's very rainy outside as it has been for the last couple of weeks um anyway it's great to be here with you all um i have a few thoughts on it i mean i spent 25 years in corporate um and i really did get to experience firsthand uh some of the ways that women are treated differently i mean if we look at some of the facts that we've got, like if you look at the Fortune 500, um, there's only 7.4% are women CEOs. Um, as a female entrepreneur myself, I have two companies that I've launched, one with my fabulous husband, who is all for women's empowerment. Um, we're less likely to get funding as well as on entrepreneurs. Um, and so therefore women are less likely to, are more likely to experience financial insecurity as well. And then if we even look at super, um, superannuation, now that's an Australian thing. I think in America, you might have a different term for it. So sorry, don't know what that term is, but um, we're, we're less likely to have, I think it's like 47% uh, less super over the course of our career than um, our counterparts without, with, with men. So, and then just Sarah, add, adding on to, your um your point around legislation and female bodies i mean you only need to look at feminine products um, we pay more for products in general but then add on um you know feminine products we're paying for things that are just that should actually we shouldn't be paying for basically so i think um yeah it's a really good point that you raised there sarah oh. thank you Absolutely brilliant. What a strong opening with Sarah and Marianne. Can we give a round of applause to those amazing boss ladies? And, um, of course, I want to bounce over to the amazing and wonderful Dr Liz and their Master Coach, Sonia. And Master, give a big wave to Master Coach Sonia. Master Coach Sonia is with us, one of our legendary panellists. We're going to bounce to Dr Liz and Master Coach Sonia. Dr Liz, so good seeing you on Friday in Queensland. I hope you're getting drier and safer up there. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, it was awesome. Good to see you there. Amazing meetup. Yeah, we're still very damp, still very wet. But uh, yes, the, all the flooding and everything is receding. So most of us are getting back to normal, which is awesome. Pleasure. And Dr. Liz, please give your reactions to amazing Sarah and Marianne and let us know. I know you're oh, very, very absolute expert on how women treat it differently. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, completely echo what, um, what both Sarah and Marianne have so nicely said. Um, and while I want to state that, you know, absolutely in a lot of ways things are improving, so it's not like, you know, when my mum arrived here in Australia from the UK and wasn't allowed in any of the pubs and, you know, Dad, she'd sit in the car and Dad would grab the beer and hand it out the window to her. <laughs> so whether you want to say that's progress or not, we have improved in some ways. But I'll just give you some simple examples. So, um, you know, whenever I'd go on the plane or go anywhere, it was always, um, you know, Miss Eisenring and Dr Eisenring or Professor Eisenring to my husband. Now, my husband, you know, is not an academic. He didn't get that PhD. He's not a doctor. You know, that all belonged to me. But it was automatically just associated and, and said to him, I've been to conferences where I'm the plenary speaker, it's all over there, Professor Liz Isingring, same thing, you know, oh, welcome, you know, to my husband and nothing to me. So, and this is as recently as just a couple of years ago. So, you know, silly things like that, which really shouldn't mean much, but once again, it's just that assumption. It's the assumption that it's my husband has to be the doctor or the professor and not myself. So, yeah. That's terrible. So you're the one who's done decades of well, work to this day, but of course, because you're female, you're not the professor, it has to be the man, right? Yeah, yeah. So silly little things like that. But right. I think it's the example, it's the tip of the iceberg of just perhaps some of those some subconscious decisions that people are just, just making and assumptions that things are happening every single day. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, well, that was, that, I'm, I'm a dude and that annoys me because you deserve <laughs> yeah. it, Dr. Liz. Well, thank you. I pick up on it now. In the early days, I was too shocked to say anything, but I do correct them all now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But if someone does it to you again, I suggest you throw a full can of Coke at them. That's my advice to you. Okay. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> we love you. Right, I'm a full set, Dr. Liz. And, oh, my God, even that's knocking me off my chair. That's absolutely nuts. <laughs> We're going to go to Master Coach Sonia, then my friend Karen Clark. Master Coach Sonia, how are you? It's so good to see you. What's been happening? Oh, just been busy, busy. A um, lot of uh, helping a lot of repeat clients and getting them ready for the workforce. Um, a lot of people are pivoting 
into a new role. And um, as a career coach, I see, I see a lot of, um, you know, income disparities and plus from the HR background um, living in the North of the United or the Midwest, the United States and the South, I definitely see, you know, the gender discrimination, um, the income disparity, um, more violence against women um, versus men, whether it's in the military or in the workforce. Um, and then promotions, um, it, it, it's more often women get overlooked for a promotion than a man. And, and uh, that's, that's um, I've experienced that um, firsthand. And then it's the good old boy network. Um, if you guys have ever heard that expression and that no matter if you live in the South or the North, I've experienced it in both. And, and then, you know, the, you always hear that the gla- hitting the glass ceiling for women, um, you know, we're, you know, women are breaking through that glass ceiling, but it's still there. And so, um, you know, I, I think this is a great topic that you picked today, Edward and, and uh, Lassie. Oh, and just so you know, I did not pick this topic. I am merely a pawn of wonderful Lassie who did it. So if you can all uh, give Lassie a wave, she'll see the recording. We love you, Lassie. Lassie's doing all the all the Thank you, stuff right now. Yeah, we all love Lassie, so connect with Lassie. But um, now well said, Master Coach Shonya. We love you. Round of applause to Master Coach Shonya. We appreciate you. And um, keep your comments going. Keep your comments going in the chat. I'm going to go through some in a minute. But before I do that, I want to hear from Karen Clark. Now, Karen Clark and I, we certainly broke the glass ceiling. We had a few drinks um, in a nice pub full of men and women before we hit our event on Friday, didn't we? Yeah, we did. And it was amazing. And how long have you been drinking gin for, Karen? <laughs> All my life, Ed. Ah, that's that's a long time. I've had a couple more zero birthdays than you, Ed. <laughs> uh, no, I'm actually a lot. I'm actually a lot more older than you think. But Karen, great seeing you on Friday. Please give us your reactions to what you've heard, and love to hear what you think. Wow. Well, um, I, I'm, I totally agree with everyone, um, and you know, right through from the stats of Mary Ann's to the American way of. Um, you know, they were talking about how in America they actually, women are treated completely differently. I just want, I really want to temper that by saying that there are men out there who are an exception to a lot of this. However, you know, I believe that, and in fact, there's a stat here in a little book I've got, which says that only 30% of women are in key management positions even today, and they say that it's going to take until 2095 until we have a 50% uh, equity in that that area. And I'm actually writing, this is my topic, I'm actually writing a white paper on women in male-dominated industries, and we haven't really touched on what I discovered. And I want to say once again that it's not all men who treat women like this. However... Women are treated in many cases separately in the male dominated industries that are very much male, like the construction industry and the automotive industry, some women by some men in such a way that it would appall you. I have been interviewing women in this area and there has been absolute barbaric behavior and disrespect to women down to the level of um, forcing women to have sex with them, um, telling women to show their breasts to them in the workplace and being really, really disrespectful and derogatory. And as I say, in these very male dominated industries, as well as them not being looked after, say at the apprentice and training level, like a man would be. So just put out there and left to basically fend for themselves. So there is a huge disparity between the way women are treated and the way men are treated in especially those particularly male dominated industries. And we'll get on to maybe why and how we can change it later. But what I discovered with my interviews, I started by talking about 
talking to business owners, women entrepreneurs and business owners. And, you know, one example was that of that is like Dr. Lizzie says, as I call her, um, you know, a woman who has this amazing three businesses, actually, and she knows how to do everything in her business in the, in the construction industry. And she they make um, concrete and terrazzo and all those kind of things for architects. And, you know, they basically wholesale. And she said she would continually get um, men on the phone because she answered the phone and she would get men on the phone saying, can I, can I speak to a man who knows, who knows about this? And of course, she know, you know, she said she knew how to use the tools, she knew how to do everything, and she would continually get requests to speak to a man when someone rang for information or help. So it and that's you know, that's current. Yeah. And just adding to that, um, I, as you know, I work closely with Microsoft. Um, in the Microsoft flagship store, I know a lot of the uh, characters there, happens all the time. You get young, young guys and ladies, you know, usually in their 20s working there, and to this day. A guy will come in and let's say a, a lady will serve him. He goes, oh, can I speak to a dude? I want to talk more about gaming or this and that. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and quite often the ladies know more about tech than men these days. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. So, crazy. So there we oh. go. <clears throat> we love you, Karen. Round of applause to Karen. It's a pleasure. In a moment, I'm, we're going to bounce back to Sarah for the next uh, level of digging in. But I'm going to go through some of your comments. So keep your comments coming. I'm just going to browse through them quickly. And to see things. So we've got wonderful Carsten Nielsen with it. We love Carsten Nielsen. Great uh, man for women's empowerment. And he basically is talking about surveys and research and different uh, hurdles that exist for women. So love your contributions, my friend. We've got Camilla with us. We love you, Camilla. Camilla's are actually running a workshop. Should check it out. We've got Simone Louise here. Simone Louise, you know, um, is absolute body empowerment. We love you. We've got Alessia and Ronaldo, my friend from Italy. He is one of the wonderful men's day for women's empowerment and just want to say keep up that networking creep keep the conversations coming so what we're going to do is i want to bounce back to amazing sarah polyakov is an absolute winner and we're going to bounce into the next round of question we're going to dig that little bit deeper because so i'm going to talk about and this is maybe a bit more historic or an academic question but i'm going to ask the wonderful panelists where did this all come from very deep question i, I do i'm asking a very deep question I'd just love to hear your number one thoughts. Where did all this glass ceiling and bias and stuff come from? I don't know. That's why I want to ask these wonderful ladies. Sarah Polyakov, where did it all come from? And um, by the way, please keep the answer short because I'm asking everyone a question that can be easily a thesis. But where's the number one reason you think it all came from? All this bias and BS. Okay. In the United States, we were legally considered chattel. In the 1800s, we could be bought. Just jumping in, um, for the sake of the audience, chattel is a legal term for some kind of living property like um, cattle and stock. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We could be bought and sold like livestock. Yeah. Uh, we didn't get the ability to vote until the 1920s. I haven't done my exact history on this, but... So we've made this incredible quantum leap from, I mean, in my opinion, from being bought and sold to being able to work and vote. That's kind of a quantum leap within a century. However, it's not enough. And I believe that we got here due to those old belief systems that we are still trying to shed. Wow. Well said. Love your work. Amazing, Sarah. And I come from an Arabic background. And as you know, we don't have a great track on women's rights, even to this day. So crazy. You know, we love you, Sarah. Marianne, I want to pose that incredibly difficult question that you could answer in a 30,000 word thesis. Where did all this bias come from, Marianne? I think, like Sarah said, that um, we have made progress. Um, you know, women can now open bank accounts without their husband. Um, they can actually stay in employment now post having a baby. But um, if we look at it generally, it's, it's social norms and conditioning, cultural conditioning. So that may vary depending on where you sit in the world. But, you know, typically women are raised as the carer um, and boys are raised as the provider. And obviously there are always exceptions to this, but generally this is what is happening. And in society, the role of provider is um, given, you know, um, more what's the word, prominence or 
Um, then the role of the carer. So you only need to look at nursing, teaching. These roles are severely underpaid for what the roles that they do. Mm. But then you've got some other roles um, typically held by men which pay, you know, exorbitant amounts of money yet don't have the same um, level of impact on stress and people and society's well-being as well. So I think it's really down to social and uh, social and cultural norms, and it's up to us to really start to get conscious about how we are um, keeping those norms going. Yeah. Oh, well said. Here, here, Marianne. Love it, love it, love it. We're going to hear from Master Coach Sonia and then, of course, Dr Liz, Master Coach Sonia. What are your thoughts and reactions to what you've heard so far and where did all this bias come from? Um, this great, um, great perspectives, everybody. Um, I also feel that male, the male perspective in the society of humanity that men are more dominant than women because men are perceived physically as stronger than women um, and the generally they're the more educated ones than women um, you know when we look back in centuries centuries ago you know with our kings and our rulers and um, you know they were all men and and then you know when we did get the right to vote in 1920 here in the United States you know a lot of women were still stereotyped into certain roles like nurses or teachers or, or, or mothers and, and, um, you know, to have, to have the ability to go to college and get educated so they could have more of a competitive, um, equality, um, and then in that aspect, but still, um, it doesn't, it, it's, it's still there. And, um, the, you know, the times are changing and I think, I, I read. I saw a podcast. Me uh, is like the females. Uh, um, it's not about you know the gender. It's about humanity. It's about be, being treated like a human being, and and being treated equal for all. Well said, Master Coach Shania. Absolutely love it. Powerful, powerful. We're going to bounce over to amazing Dr. Liz and then Karen Clark. Dr. Liz, what are your thoughts and reactions and where did this bias come from? Amazing. Two main points I want to share. So the first I agree, I think it's just the gender norms and, you know, how it all evolved with the men being the, the hunter and the primary income earner. And uh, even though things have changed quite a bit, what's interesting is that the research shows even in those households where the, the woman actually has the highest income as a primary income earner, that they still do more than 50% of sort of the household chores and family things at home. So, you know, no wonder so many of these amazing busy women, are, you know, and just feeling a bit overstretched because not only are they killing it, and let's be fair, often having to be twice if not three times as good as their male counterpart to make it to those very senior positions, but even if they're lucky enough to have some support at home, um, the research shows that they're still doing absolutely more than their fair share when they get home. So I guess that's one point I want to make. <laughs> Don't know if you want to add anything to that. <laughs> brilliant, okay. brilliant. Thank no, you. please tell us your second yeah. point. Well, and then well, the second point is I do also just want to raise that I, you know, we've mentioned we've got all these amazing supporting men, particularly who are on here, and I know we do have some great uh, male supporters all over the place. But I think it's going to be really tricky going forward, you know, mum of a teenage boy, and particularly in the, the early years, I think a lot of the girls are, are showing up the guys academically in the schooling system, but then knowing how does this all play out in terms of all those gender roles as it then comes out to careers and things. So you've got this talented bunch of bright young things coming through, but, you know, a lot of them are, are women and the women are definitely, sorry, the girls are giving them the, the boys a, a show for their money, particularly in male-dominated areas like mass, physics, technology, et cetera. But yet they then released into this work environment, <clears throat> excuse me, where we're still used to having all those leadership positions filled by men. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I'm just, just putting it out there that I think there's some interesting dynamics and interesting things for both men and women that we really need to just support and create opportunities because otherwise it's going to turn into a little bit of an interesting mess, I think. 
One um, amazing Dr. Liz Ram, of course, Dr. Liz, and I just want to throw another cat amongst the pigeons. I've never ever, and this is a bit controversial here, I've never ever been comfortable with single gender schools. Never have. From the age of four years old, I'd always fold my arms and say there's something not right about this. And they actually identified it in terms of women's rights. They're saying the problem with all boys' schools is that it merely perpetuates the boys' network and the boys' networking club. And it's like, well, that's a good argument. I wish I thought of that when I was a four-year-old because I've never been comfortable with the whole single gender schools. I know there's pros and cons on by the side, but tell you what, I don't know. I think um, single gender schools, you can take a photo of them. They're going to be in the history bin the way things are looking. Love it. Karen Clark. Karen, so good having you with us. What do you think and where did all this bias come from, Karen Clark? Well, it's interesting you should say about single-sex schools, Ed, because I actually went to a single-sex school, um, obviously a girls-only school. And, and maybe um, I'm wrong. I could be wrong. So if I'm wrong, please tell me if I'm wrong. Well, it's interesting because, you know, first of all, let's go back. Just park that one for a minute. Let's go back to what... Um, Mary Ann said and Dr. Liz said, and you know, the, the thing about it's cultural and it's societal, and um, I agree with all that. I agree with it. However, I also, and Mary Ann alluded to this, it's not just cultural, it's actually intrinsic. So it's how we are made. Men are intrinsically the providers. And women are intrinsically the nurturers. So we have particular qualities and characteristics that are part of us in general. I can't say all, but most women are more nurturers and men are more providers intrinsically. And so that's the start of it. And then that also creates the, um, the chattels as in America and the, the men, you know, believing that women are there to do a certain role. And that happened from, you know, for decades, for centuries. Uh, however, Queen Cleopatra was a very long time ago, one of the first people who got educated and did things that, and studied maths and did things that women did not do. Um, and in fact, I was in Egypt with the woman who is excavating for Queen Cleopatra's tomb because she believes that Queen Cleopatra was the last of the feminine rulers. And this is important. This is interesting. The last of the feminine rulers, up until now even probably, who ruled with the feminine virtues. virtues. And Marianne and I have had a discussion about this previously in that a lot of women who get up to very high levels are basically forced to become a leader in the way that men lead, become, you know, executives and top CEOs, and then take on the, the ways that men do it. So, um, yeah, to talk about the, um, the old boy network with single sex schools, I totally agree. I think that's what, what is perpetuating it in young men in that they, they are still growing up believing a lot of these uh, inequalities around women and men. So what causes it? I also believe that there is a perpetuation caused by the way women think about themselves. And so I grew up in a single sex school. However, I mentioned before that I grew up with a father who treated me like he treated my brother and he taught us all my sister and my brother and I that we could we were equal and so I believed when I grew up that I was equal to any man any woman and any person of any level or qualification or um, um, you know position and so that's how I grew up that I was equal so therefore I never ever had an issue talking with someone who was what might be perceived above me in education or any other level. Fantastic gift. And I brought up my daughters the same. And so when I say it's within us, I believe that when my daughter in her fourth or fifth year out of university asked her boss who and their lawyers, she's a lawyer, for to become an associate in the firm, which is unheard of that early, no, sorry, in her second year, second or third year out of uni, she asked her boss, I want to become an associate. She got associate because she asked for it. Most women 
will not ask like a man will because of all this conditioning and all this societal going, you know, goings on. So what I'm saying is it's a two-way street. We women don't actually behave like the men do in many cases. And therefore, we don't get what the men will have the confidence to ask for and have the confidence to carry through in many ways. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Round applause to Karen Clark. And it feeds into Camilla. Uh, threw an, a, a, she didn't throw a cat amongst the pigeons. She threw a small tiger amongst the pigeons. And, it, and it's a great question. And we're going to um, use this one and you want to watch it too. Camilla says, I'd love the panel to consider the question, how do women contribute to perpetuating the bias? Oh, we're going to um, yes. throw that cat, that tiger amongst the pigeons. So get ready, panelists, for this one. I'm just going to go through the other comments as well. Keep your comments coming. Connect with each other on LinkedIn too. Winnie, we love you. Um, make sure you connect with everyone, sharing their LinkedIn links. Uh, Sue Rich says, um, yeah. wow, I've worked in the car trade since I was 21. The way I got the management position was asking for it. Absolutely, absolutely. Now I'm keeping my mouth shut because i got a few thoughts, but <laughs> panelists, not me. <laughs> uh, Camille's talking about a wonderful book. And uh, Carsten is really with the stats and details, which you absolutely love. We've got some great questions there. And um, and a great one from, a great thought from Joy, uh, Joy Santiago um, talking that, you know, about the whole break of women and men and motherhood, which is amazing. So, yeah, a lot of great discussion. Keep it up. So let's bounce over to amazing Sarah Polyakov. And um, I love that little um, deflection we're having here because that's one of the big things. It's very easy to say men are the villains and men are evil and men are that, and some men most certainly are. However, how are wonderful women contributing to the bias? Because it's always good to look in the mirror. Sarah, love your work. How are women contributing to the bias that we obviously all stand against? Okay, so I'm going to ba go back to some psychology research that started, I believe, in the 1970s. The American psychologist who started this research termed it relational aggression, relational aggression. And this means when... Um, women are biased towards each other and try to keep other women from succeeding. Where are the roots of this? She found that when we're little girls, we do something called evening. So as in evening the score. So if a little girl has a doll and there are other little girls in the room, everybody needs to have the same doll, if that makes sense. If there's a piece of cake or a birthday cake, each slice of cake has to be the same size. Little girls naturally gravitate toward making sure that everything is equal. Then we hit puberty and it all changes. We're, the hormones throw us into a completely different world. Uh, we're also sometimes pitted against each other due to um, when we become women, there's this whole beauty standard thing that we have to deal with. So that is in direct opposi opposition to how we behaved when we are little girls. And so we become passive aggressive. And that is basically called relational aggression. And that's, that's how it happens. So even good women can unconsciously sabotage other women, unfortunately, because they're subconsciously just trying to make sure that everybody gets the same thing. And so that's the research I wanted to point to. Thank so then you. I suppose following that, just to unpack it a bit more, so, so following that logic, if you have a big, a deep belief that everyone should have the same, if therefore one of your lady friends gets more, well, she should share that with the team, huh? How dare you take off? I suppose, does it support that type of tall poppy logic? That, that, that's exactly what relational aggression is. It's uh, when you can have a group of friends where everybody gets along and let's say they all have the same job title. They're all on the same corporate team and they're all friends. Then let's imagine one of them gets promoted manager i've seen this happen hmm. the yeah. relationships fall apart it usually happens where the team now turns against the woman who used to be their friend yeah. and that's relational aggression because we've taken away that uh that equality 
And um, it's not something that people do to be mean. It's uh, it just goes against what we learned as little girls. We learned that everything needs to be equal. So when there's this perception that something is not equal, uh, our subconscious mind reacts and it can come out in some pretty ugly behaviors, unfortunately. And this is where we need to look within and say, okay, are we living through these old patterns where everything has to be equal? And why can't we be happy for our friend? Because if our friend is doing a good job, why can't we be happy for her? Right? Uh, well said. It's almost the socialism versus capitalism discussion. Yeah. Amazing, Sarah. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. We'll have a pause to you, Sarah. Just incredible. Yeah. Marianne Dahan. Marianne, I'd love to hear all your thoughts on this topic. I know you're an absolute pro. Please give us your unpack. Well, there's so many different aspects. I could go with all of what's been said. So um, I'm loving this conversation. I did want to pick on, pull out, I should say, not pick on, um, pull out one particular. Um, and Karen, you talked about it. And, um, and I want to talk about the systems that have been created. So systems have typically been created by white males as the dominant culture. So there is, there is an element, well, there is privilege, white privilege that comes with that. So a lot of the times, like when we have women going up and um, people of colour going, those that are not part of the dominant culture going up in these systems, we're being forced to adopt and to comply to these systems. So, for example, I'll talk about myself as a female, as a female, like, I have very strong feminine qualities, which I knew was not valued in corporate. So I'm highly intuitive. I can bring people together. I'm collaborative. I have deep listening, deep presence, and I know how to look after my team and get them high performing. However, they aren't as valued as the masculine traits. And I just want to say that masculine and feminine traits are not gender specific. Men can have both. Women can have both. But the system values the masculine traits as well so I think when we're looking at women and I used to, I, I actually left a company because I was looking up at all the female leaders and the male leaders to be honest as well going oh I don't want to be like that like that's not me I want to be um, somebody that is taking care of their people and bringing them on the journey and I think society because there was such scarcity in the roles senior roles women had to fight for them and that meant well I have to do whatever it takes to step on their shoulders and get where I need to go because there's only a certain amount of opportunity for women at the top. Um, I personally never wanted to be part of that. Um, I would never step on any of my fellow sisters to get more money or a promotion and I know many of my fellow sisters feel exactly the same and have opted out of the corporate world to build their own company that are built on genuine inclusion for all, not just male and female, but diversity across the board. So I think there's um, there's a big shift that needs to happen for this to all change, and that is about dismantling some of these systems that don't serve the greater. And men, I don't believe men are the problem here at all. Men are also suffering from gender inequality as well. So that is why it's really important. I mean, I'm very blessed. I've got an amazing husband that is very much about women's empowerment and things like that. And we, we um, our company, Quantum Leap Global, is about going out to the world for inclusion for all. And that's authentic inclusion, not just, hey, here's my system. You can come join it, but you've got to apply by my rules. It's about saying, let's recreate the system. Like it, I like it, Marianne. Absolutely brilliant. Um, two reactions from me on that one. Firstly, your husband's a very attractive man. Point one. Is he, it the bull uh, uh, even, even if he had a full <laughs> afro, I'd still say he's attractive. There you go. Uh, the second re second thing is, um, I make this running joke. Um, when, when I was younger, I've actually been to a lot of protests in my life, and my wonderful mother at times would take me to a lot of uh, women's empowerment protests. I'm talking like 20, 30 years ago. And, um, oh, and we'd always make sort of Arabic jokes saying, ah, oh, we need like more of an angry mob. We need some AK-47s and Molotov cocktails. That'll create the change that we want. So there you go. I think it's quite funny. A bit of Arab humour, my apologies. Let's bounce over to the amazing and powerful Master Coach Sonia. And then we're going to hit up Dr. Liz and Karen Clark. Master Coach Sonia, 
So honored to have you with us. Please tell us what you think. Love to hear your unpack and your legendary thoughts. Um, I really like what you said, Marianne, about you know corporate America as far as how the the systems that are put in place, most of those systems are put in place by men and those systems are failing. And so in order for um, us to have more equality, those systems I think need to be created you know, by both um, and move forward with a new model because, you know, there's not just men on this planet, there's women too, or, you know, um, and I think that, um, you know, shifting the mindset with, with this gender um, equality or, um, you know, the way that men are perceived versus women are perceived, I think if, if we can help, you know, re-educate those, you know, uh, about the, you know, shifting their mindset to see a bigger picture and, um, and another perspective instead of looking at the dominant male as the provider and the woman as the nurturer, you know, we're, we're always going to have those inherent um, qualities about us because our genders are different. But when it, we can come together in areas that um, would be conducive for all, that's where I think the, the system or the model needs to be changed. Oh, you hear well said. Love you, Sonia. Sonia, brilliant. Brilliant, Sonia. Dr. Liz. Dr. Yeah. Uh, correction, Professor Liz. Oh, uh, yeah, but we got I, Oh, sorry, hit the mute key, Dr. Liz. Professor Liz. Professor Liz. Thank you. I consciously made the decision to go back with doctor after leaving academia because professor does sound a little bit old and stuffy. So <laughs> I pull, I use it when I need it, but I'm uh, I'm actually fine with Liz or Dr. Lizzie, as Karen says. That's pretty cute. I, I call you Dr. Liz, especially you know, like when we were seeing each other in prison, I'd be, you're not Liz. Dr. Liz. Yes, Dr. Liz. No, Dr. Liz. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. But please, of course. Awesome. Thank you. I just wanted to say, and may hats off to Lassie for another fabulous topic and hats off to everyone. Such a great discussion. And please make sure to, I know everyone is, but read the comments, some absolutely amazing, powerful shares and discussions going on there. Love it, love it, love it. Look, I can echo so much of what, what is happening. I did really want to focus on Mary Ann. I actually had a similar sort of epiphany for why I transitioned out of academia into starting my own business as well. And a big part of it was um, not liking the culture at the very top and uh, wanting to create, you know, my own culture. So I think we had a similar motivation in that way. But what does concern me, though, is it means the people that stay are the ones that are really entrenched and survive in that. So my concern is... How's it going to get better unless we we do shake it up or, you know, bring in uh, like we spoke about, um, you know, teams together or, or contributing and trying to make the new rules together. But anyway, maybe we can just avoid that by uh, highlighting it through the amazing work we do through our own businesses. But it is it is a bit of a fear of mine that the ones that stay are either because they're not going to get employed anywhere else, <laughs> in my opinion, because they're often not not amazingly talented, but they've got particular skills and they just sit in those very senior positions. Uh, but two, I think, you know, we're getting a whole alternative of other amazing, innovative, creative, passionate people creating their own businesses and leading change that way, which I think is great. And my final bit, I just wanted to, to focus, like I strongly believe, I say empowered women empower women, and I believe that, but I can change it to empowered people empower people. Because I think that that tall poppy wanting to tear people down, all that sort of stuff, it comes from insecurity or um, jealousness or whatever it might be. And I don't see as much of it nowadays, luckily, but some of the worst cases I've seen, as we mentioned, are from other women. And it's often from other senior women who had to show more of those masculine traits, who did have to do it tough, who you know, purposely didn't have families or prioritise work over family, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I, I get it. They paved the way for us. And a lot of them have done it really hard. Some I see are amazing and mentor and bring through women. But I have unfortunately seen very sad cases where it's okay to a certain level. As soon as you start overtaking or, or getting to a certain level, they then can tear you down. So just highlighting some of those challenges and that I think the more we can support and nurture and mentor and be role models for both genders you know, the better it's going to be. 
Uh, well said, Dr. Liz. Absolutely amazing. Round of applause to you, Dr. Liz. And of course, we want to hear from Karen Clark. Karen Clark, what are your thoughts and unpacks on this one? Yeah, so interesting, the last two, especially Marianne and Liz, not that everyone else is interesting, but I want to talk to those points um, and re remind you, Liz, Dr. Lizzie, that Marianne actually is making change with her business. So she goes into those companies now and trains them on, on um, safety in the workplace um, psycho safety in the workplace and I'm sure she addresses a lot of those issues with the whole workplace including the men at the top would that be fair comment Marianne <laughs> yes thank you yes yeah. and thanks for the plug <laughs> so yeah so she is doing it whereas we are in our own businesses and we're not really making that impact so Mary Ann and her partner Michael who we met meet at the um at our meetups are, are doing it, are actually in there making that difference. Um, so I want to address a, a couple of points. Um, with, go back to the talking about the women are the ones who not only go out to work, but we also often end up doing more than, you know, our fair share of the, um, the homework at home. And I want to come back again to... You know, there's two, there's two people in this relationship or whatever. And if a woman is doing that, <clears throat> then she's partly guilty of it herself. It's like saying, if you allow something, not only the person who's doing it to you is in the wrong, but you are playing a part in allowing that abuse or whatever it is, right? So I think women, we do it because we are brought up to believe that our role is to make sure the home is clean and tidy and, you know, cook, we cook for the family and all of that. And then we go out to work and we end up trying to be super woman, woman. However, like I say, it's about boundaries. So if, and this is about relationships and boundaries, and yes, sometimes if we say to our partners, I'm not going to do that anymore, I want you to come and do half of this or share in the load, then it might mean in some cases when it um, escalates that the relationship will break up however it still comes down to the boundaries that we set in any relationship whether it's at work or at home that is what is perpetuating this situation that's all I've got to say oh, brilliant as always Karen Clark round of applause for you now we're going to move into our final round of questions and well what I'm going to be asking is basically what change can we create in our own backyards? Because I hear a lot of people saying, we can change the world by doing this and doing that. And it's like, okay, and you're going to do nothing, right? Yeah. So one thing I think is very important is what change can we create in our own backyards to make it all happen? That'll be the final round of questioning. But before I do that, I want to go through the group chats. The group chat's amazing. So keep the group chat coming. Um, again, if you are watching the recording, you probably can't see the group chat, but make sure if you're watching the recording, connect with everyone. So I'm going to react to a few of the comments. So Liz and Karen's having a great chat. Camilla is right into it. Camilla, we absolutely love you. Keep up the great work. And I love your tiger amongst the pigeons. Uh, and interesting, Carsten makes a point, which I couldn't agree with more, talking about when it comes to women's right movements, there's too much infighting is basically. I couldn't agree with it more. And interestingly, um, obviously, I, you know, I am right into women's empowerment. I've had feminists attack me for not being doing a women's empowerment the right way. It's like, okay, do you want me to be your enemy then? You know, like, it, and it's crazy. It's sort of like allies attacking allies. I think it's insane. Another thing I just want to add to that is, um, yeah, I've had a lot of feminists attack me. And I says, what do you want from me? I'm trying to help. Yeah, you know, it's like, whatever. And, and that's the point. I think infighting is such a bad thing, be it in politics or all that. So I couldn't agree more. So I think infighting is a big problem. If um, I think that's what um, legendary Carsten is saying. And um, Sue Rich makes a good point. I actually know this topic quite well. Uh, men actually don't live as long as women. Women are genetically mm. built to live longer. Mm. So that's actually true. Go check it out. But um, we women usually almost always outlast men because you're built to live longer. So there you go. There you go, which is very, very true. And also us men do stupid things and we get killed quicker. So there we go. That's a, <laughs> that's due to lower intelligence of men, perhaps. 
Uh, and we've got some great discussion there. Um, and I got one from Simone, actually. I like this. I love you, Simone. The reason everyone waved to Simone Louise. Simone Louise is an amazing woman. And I like Simone on many levels. And Simone is a very honest lady. Like, I had a moment of self questioning when my eight year old son wanted to get his ear pierced. And it was a hard no from me. Yeah. But then I reflected on this. Oh, it was my daughter, I'd do it. And I'd be the same if my son walked up to me and said, Dad, I want to get my ear pierced. I think, I, I think I'd make some horrible sexist remark as a reflex. But I have to stop myself and deprogram my subconscious sexism. So there you go. But I understand that. And it's, it's very true. And um, and be quick, cool, a big wave to Eileen Abad. Eileen Abad is actually one of our regular panelists. She's in uh, listen mode on this one, which is awesome. So um, uh, we love Eileen Abad. So make sure you connect with Eileen Abad as well. And um, some other great comments. So what I want to do is I just want to bounce through the final round of questioning and wish you all a wonderful day and evening. Uh, and just keep the great comments going. Um, but before I do that, um, before I go to the final round of questioning, Eileen Avard, I just want to say a quick hello. You don't have to, I know you're in listen only, mate. Do you want to say a quick hello only because we love you? Just a quick hello from you, Eileen Avard, out of because we love you. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. I just love the chat and I'm gaining so much perspective on the historical thing and, and really how we love the way that's been expressed about the past conditioning and, and why there was no contributing into this is the way that I was brought up that unless you really have something wordy and historical to say, if, if you're only going to say a lot of bias, then it's better just to keep your mouth shut. And really, <laughs> I love this perspective and I'm just learning heaps. Something that was brought up from my mom, respect of the people, and, and and how, if I have just quickly one minute, is that when you, when the conditioning of the parenting, say that because we will, we will value from our hard workingness. So when we are poor, everybody has to contribute. There's no genders that comes in, in there. And it is about your hard work that's been valued. And with that kind of mindset, you view people from that. So when I'm hearing all these different corporate mindset, I say, oh, my God, is that really happening? I don't have that in me, so I don't see. I'm very inclusive, so it was just lovely. Thanks, Edward, for the opportunity. Love the discussion. Thank you. Oh, we love you. We love you, Arlene. There you go. I have trouble with you in spectator mode because you're usually the brick through the window. So it's good seeing the other side of you. I love it. Now we love Arlene. Seriously, connect with Arlene. Amazing lady. And um, it's really good. Now, final round of questioning. And um, and and I do ask the panellists to keep the answer really brief and on point because you could probably spend two hours answering this question. It's a tough one. But the question I want to ask you is, I don't want to ask a big broad statement like, oh my God, we need to, we need to do this and do this. We need to change the world. No, no, no. What can we do in our own backyard? That's a bit I'm really interested in. What can we do as individuals to create the change we want? So Sarah, I love your work, Sarah. Sarah, what change can we create in our own backyards to break the bias? Awesome. Okay, so it doesn't even need to start in our own backyard. It simply needs to start from within our hearts. Yeah. And when it enters our hearts, it enters our mind. And then that creates our behaviors. So we become naturally a change agent. And then we're able to model that behavior for the world. And hopefully others will follow in our footsteps. So that's my succinct answer. Oh my God, Sarah, absolutely brilliant. And Sarah, I've got to say, um, it's so good having you with us. And thank you for all you do with us. We really appreciate you, Sarah. Thank you. Very good. And just a quick one, your name, is your name, just so people connect with Sarah, on LinkedIn, okay. your name has a Y in it. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I have the phonetic spelling up there because uh, <laughs> that's how it's pronounced. And I forgot to change it before I entered the Zoom meeting. So it's a Y-A-K-O-V. Got it. Got it. So yeah. we love you. Yeah. So, ev yeah. so everyone, please connect with Sarah Polyakov. We love you, Sarah. Thank you. I love you guys too. Oh, beautiful. You. Work, Sarah. Now, Sarah's amazing. We go way back, so make sure you connect with her. We're going to bounce over to Marianne. 
Marianne, what change can we create in our own backyards to break the bias, Marianne? Well, spot on, Sarah. My very first point was know thyself. And if you don't know yourself, get to know yourself and get to really learn your own um, conscious and unconscious bias. We all have them. So it is our job to do the inner work first. Um, And then just even on a home front, instead of focusing on gender roles, which we're highly conditioned with, start to go, well, even if you've got children or you're looking at um, supporting your nieces or nephews, whatever is your circle of influence focus on what they enjoy what are they good at and move away from gender-based roles would be my other tip oh, giving it short for you ed oh brilliant i don't I know, I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna brilliant marianne and, and just so you know how can we find you on, Mar- on linkedin marianne I did put my um, details in the chat and I have been connecting with people as you go. So I will send it, put it in the chat again. I would love to stay in contact. Oh, it's a pleasure. We love you, Marianne. And can we give a wave out to amazing Michael Dahan, Marianne's wonderful man. So there we go. We love you, Michael Dahan. Handsome, bald guy like me. So there we go. Um, Michael Dahan's doing more of the Bruce Willis. I'm doing more of the, I suppose, the Ben Kingsley. There you go. There you go. So it's good. I gotta say, I love where this is all going. Master Coach Sonia, tell me what you think. Love to hear it, Master Coach Sonia. I think um, there are so many insightful uh, ladies on here today, and I, I'm thankful to have been here. I loved learning more um, about the different topics that, you know. Um, like, you know, psycho safety, I would really be interested to learn more about um, because I think, you know, um, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example, our basic level is, you know, taking care of our, our needs. And, and a lot of people um, endure so much stress in their life. And when you're under stress, then that kicks in the fight or flight or freeze mode and then your cortisol levels inside go up and that that makes your body feel bad but you know if we can really um tap into um being aware of our basic needs and and listen to our body and then also um focusing on our um energy as far as being more positive and trying to relay that to others and and uh, and you know we know there's there's always probably going to be this, but if we can help them, um, like the 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 increase the awareness, then I think that that will be a a big um, component in all of this. Brilliant, Master Coach Sonia. Well said. Can we have Master Coach Sonia round of applause? Absolutely love you. That's a pleasure. I think poor Master Coach Sonia, who are inter- having a bit Did of internet trouble. But we, oh, sorry, we're st- you still there, Master Coach Sonia? That's good. Yeah, we got you. We got you. We love your work, Master Coach Sonia. And don't you love the internet, huh? Crazy. Now, Master Coach Sonia is amazing. Make sure you connect with her. Very, very savvy lady. So amazing. Dr. Liz, <laughs> Professor Liz, <laughs> had six a six seat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, Ed. Um, look, I want to share what I've done in the past couple of years with great success, and that's what I will continue and encourage other people to do. So historically in my field, and I think it happens in a lot of fields, is as you get more senior, you get a lot more opportunities, speaking opportunities, writing opportunities, you know, you know, it's very ironic. You do the hard yards in the beginning, you'd kill to get on a scientific paper or go to a conference and everyone ignores you. And then you get to this period where you're very senior and everyone suddenly wants you, but you can't actually do it all. So it's an interesting position. Historically, what I've seen and my mentors would do would take the the top ones or what they would want to do and then farm out the other opportunities to their PhD students or other things. Um, And I was trained in that. That's what I initially did. However, I had a little bit of an epiphany a few years ago and completely did it a different way. Thought who is actually going to be the best person for this opportunity 
who's actually going to crush it, uh, even if they weren't that experienced, who could make the most of it, who's going to, you know, it could really have an impact in their career. So since thinking about it in that way, I've given some very junior people some amazing international opportunities and, and all different things. And it's worked out so brilliantly because it goes back to whoever made that point, you know, do what you're good at, what you enjoy, you're passionate about. And if you can fit people in for the right opportunity, um, you know, it literally it can fast track careers and whatever else. So that's something I've started doing the past few years. I get a big kick out of it. I know, um, you know, it's really helped the careers of lots of people. And uh, yeah, I think if we think more about who's the best fit for these opportunities, as opposed to keeping the good ones for ourselves and farming out the crappy ones, <laughs> the world would be a better place. Okay, well said. Love you, Dr. Liz. Round of applause to an amazing Dr. Liz. Appreciate you. And uh, oh, we got Master Coach Sonia back. We did get through your message, Master Coach Sonia. Actually, we'll bounce back to you for a second, Master Coach Sonia. Did you want to say anything? So we did lose your past few sentences. So feel free to make any closing thoughts, Master Coach Sonia. You got your internet back, which is awesome. No, I think I caught, I think I cursed Master Coach Sonia. So you can blame me on that um, one. Rants. Maybe type it in, Master Coach Sonia. I keep cursing your internet. So there you go. Every time I say, yeah, maybe type it in, Master Coach Sonia. We'll get you that way. But man, internet. Yeah, type it on in, Master Coach Sonia. We'll grab, we'll get your details that way. Now we lost you. Karen Clark, let's bounce to you. Let's bounce to you. Karen Clark. What do you think and how to create, how do we create change in our backyards to break the bias? Yeah, what an amazing contribution and discussion. Once again, heads up to Lassie if she created it. She did. So I believe that there, there are, there's, there's, there are many uh, associations and corporates that, that, are, that are popping up or have been around working towards changing it. And one of them is NAWIC, which is the National Association, for example, of the National Association for Women in Construction. And so they are not only supporting women and women can approach them for all sorts of issues that have come up, but they are also running courses for men. And say, so, you know, supporting men into how to integrate all of this, all of this um, intrinsic cultural societal problem that we are incurring, uh, that we are experiencing. So I, I think there is, you know, I think it won't change for a while um, completely. It won't, we won't get parity. I think it's unreasonable to expect it to just happen overnight because there are so many reasons why, and it does go back such a long way. However, as, as although the old boy network is perpetuated, um, especially as you say, Ed, through private schools oh, yeah. or single sex schools, I do believe that as the people in there, like there's probably a larger majority of men and probably women in their 50s and 60s who are still running these corporations who have these antiquated views and ways of behaving as they retire and leave the industries I think more people are coming in who want the change and so it will happen it will happen albeit gradually or not as fast as we want it to the big thing I agree with Mary Ann is our chat and Liz is changing and everyone else actually is starting from within um, that we we've, we've got to have the confidence in ourselves as women we we want to bring up our men and our women believing in parity and equity and equality we want to know that we are as good as and can do those roles with the feminine virtues the way that we do and bring to the table like Mary Ann said she brings to the table the traits that she, as a woman we're proud of and we don't want to lose those that's where I believe that change will happen. Oh, my God. Beautiful. I just love it. Can we give a big round of applause to the panellists and, of course, everyone in the chat? And um, I'll add my thoughts to all this. And I'm going to sound very Arabic. I've been sounding very Arabic lately. Uh, fight is my point, is um, if you don't like something, yeah. do something about it. Push back, fight in your own unique way because... Um, 
you know, if a bunch of people are unhappy, that can turn into a movement. So I got to say, don't take any BS. And, and same for me too. If I if I think if I think something weird and subconsciously sexist, I'm the first one to squash that horrible thought. My own psychology. So there you go. Love it. So I just want to say a big thank you. I want to wish you all the best. Now, if you are watching the recording, please connect with everyone on LinkedIn. We love that and encourage it. And to our panelists, an amazing, amazing thank you. So um, have a great day or night wherever you are in the world. Go create a bit of change. Go break the bias. Go, um, you know, um, go go uh, break a bit of glassware and uh, create a bit of change. Anyway, love your work, everyone. Big round of applause. Have a wonderful day, all. Bye, all.